Before we start the first item of business, may I advise the Chamber that the presiding officer has selected an urgent question for answer today, and that will be taken after portfolio questions. As a consequence of that, decision time will be at 10 past five, and a revised business programme has been issued to all members. First item of business is portfolio questions, and the first portfolio is finance, economy, and fair work. I remind members that questions three and seven will be grouped together. So in order to get as many people in as possible, short and succinct questions and answers, please. Question one, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its assessment is of the future of the economy. Derek Mackay. Scotland's economy has continued to grow in 2018, continuing a pattern of stronger growth over the past 18 months alongside record low levels of unemployment. The Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts Scotland's GDP to grow further by in 2019 by 1.2%, assuming a relatively smooth and orderly Brexit process. However, a no-deal Brexit puts future growth at risk. Analysis by the Scottish Government shows that a disorderly no-deal Brexit has the potential to generate a significant economic shock, which could tip the Scottish economy into recession. Depending on the scenario, uh, there is potential for GDP to contract by between 2.5% and 7% in 2019, and for the level of unemployment in that circumstance to increase by 100,000 people. So as a responsible government, uh, we are also continuing and indeed intensifying our work to prepare for all possible outcomes as best we can. However, whilst we will do everything possible to prepare for we will not be able to mitigate all of the impacts of the UK government's approach to Brexit. Bruce Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Officer. I think the Cabinet Secretary's response, I guess, in review of that response, the Cabinet Secretary will agree with me that a no-deal Brexit would be an unmitigated disaster for the Scottish economy. Does he also agree that the PM's deal would cause significant damage to businesses, jobs and the social fabric of Scotland and still in my constituency? And the only way to safeguard our economy and social fabric would be to remain in the single market and customs union, or indeed much more preferably, to actually stay in the European Union itself, as 68% of my constituents voted to do. Derek Mackay. Well, I think that analysis is fair. The Prime Minister announced uh, in Downing Street uh, on occasion the offers or the choices were hard deal, no deal, or no Brexit. We would take no Brexit. Thank you very much, because hard deal is damaging to the Scottish economy for partly the reasons that Bruce Crawford has given, and no deal is particularly catastrophic, but we both hard deal and no deal it negatively impact the economy. The only question is to what extent and to what scale. A further reminder that a no deal Brexit would lead to recession. A government, a UK government, taking us into recession with their eyes wide open of the economic consequences that that would mean for business failure, soaring unemployment, eh, reduced the support eh, for trade and success, and equally, a eh, hard deal would also be damaging in terms of eh, not keeping us within the single market and the impact on the customs union. So eh, we are concerned by this. Government in Scotland will do all we can. We've offered another way through this. We'll prepare for every contingency, but there is another way out of this, and it is in the hands of the UK government. Okay, I'll take two supplementaries. Um, shorter <coughs> answers will be required to get through them, please. Dean Lockhart. Thank you very much. Last week, the Cabinet Secretary announced plans that Scotland's economy in the future may adopt a new Scottish currency in the event of independence. Given the potential and significance of this proposal, I assume the Cabinet Secretary has made a full assessment of the financial consequences of these plans. Can I therefore ask him to confirm the level of reserves which would be required for the establishment of a new Scottish Central Bank and how these reserves would be funded. Derek Mackay. I think that question is quite fair away from uh, the question that's posed. Of course, I'm more than happy to answer it. I'm just not sure I can answer it in the time scale that I've been given by the presiding officer. Actually, I absolutely do know the proposition that we've set out in the Growth Commission. I do know the proposition that I'm presenting to the party conference, which I no longer chair, but I'll be happy to be there uh, in my party capacity. Do you know, the SNP 
considering that is what I've been asked about potential SNP policy, is one that can show how we can use the levers of independence to make our country more prosperous and fairer with the levers and the tools that come with independence. All the small advanced economies around the globe doing better than Scotland only have one thing that Scotland doesn't have, independence, and we intend to get our independence. Richard Leonard. Um, in the Scottish Government's Scotland's Place in Europe report, published in January 2018, it forecast that by 2030, 60% of the drop in Scotland's GDP would be accounted for not by a loss of trade per se, or by a loss of in-migration, but by a fall in productivity. And the Fraser of Allender Institute also wrote last year that back in 2007, the Scottish Government set a target to rank in the top quartile for productivity amongst our key trading partners in the OECD by 2017. Can you come to your question, please? That target was missed. So what Can meaningful you come steps to your question, has please? the government taken to close the productivity gap? Very, very, okay. very interesting that Richard Leonard is trying to suggest here that Brexit is not the greatest threat to Scotland's economy. I actually agree. I actually agree that productivity is a challenge and opportunity for Scotland's economy. Actually, we've made more progress on productivity over the period of devolution better than any other part of the United Kingdom. And again, since we've touched on it, thanks to the other unionists and the Conservatives, the Growth Commission was able to show how, with the powers of independence, we can enhance our productivity because it also involves people, the ability to grow our population, the ability to innovate and the ability to support an economy in the way that we cannot as part of the straitjacket that is a union that Richard Leonard so supports. Right, a quick word. This is not First Minister's questions. This is a chance for backbenchers to have questions put and answers taken by Cabinet Secretaries and Ministers who are in the Scottish Government. Can we bear that in mind, please, for the rest of this session? And I call the very sensible Mr Tavish Scott. Oh. <laughs> uh, starting off, so can I entirely endorse your sensible <laughs> remarks? Uh, um, uh, not, I, and of course I meant your observations about the front bench. Um, to, ask the, uh, to ask the Scottish Government uh, whether there are restrictions on local authorities using bond finance to support investment proposals in their areas. Derek McKay. Oh, sorry, Forbes. Kate Forbes, <laughs> the very sensible Kate Forbes. Um, well, indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's a matter for each local authority to consider how they want to borrow, including the use of bond finance and on what terms. The Local Authority Regulations 2016 set out the statutory arrangements for local authority borrowing, which, in line with the Prudential Code, should be prudent, affordable and sustainable. Tavish Scott. Thank you. Can I uh, thank the Minister for that uh, reply? Given Aberdeen City have successfully raised £415 million in bond finance to uh, finance their new uh, magnificent conference centre, uh, would the Minister uh, encourage Shetlands Council to at least explore this capital financing mechanism uh, to pay for the fixed links that are desperately needed around uh, the, uh, to join the islands uh, in, in the Shetland archipelago, uh, not least of which because, as with every government, there are considerable pressures on capital finance. Kate Forbes. I thank the member for that question and uh, as long as councils do so in a fiscally responsible manner, to, manner it, we're definitely willing to explore the possibilities of using bond finance. The, that funding mechanism has great potential for wider use in Scotland and key projects which have been um, funded through that uh, in Aberdeen is a good example of how it can be used effectively. I remind members that questions three and seven will be grouped together. Question number three, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government which parts of the economy and areas of employment are most at risk, are most at risk from a no-deal Brexit. Ivan McKee. Analysis has highlighted that all sectors and regions of the economy would be negatively affected by Brexit. However, sectors most at risk of a no-deal include agriculture, food and drink, chemicals, construction and some areas of manufacturing. Local authorities with the highest concentration of workers in these sectors are typically in more rural areas, reflecting the importance of sectors such as agriculture and fishing in these areas. John McAlpin. I thank the Minister for that answer. Dumfries and Galloway is amongst the most exposed regions of Scotland to a no deal since between 20 and 24 per cent of workers earn a wage in the most vulnerable sectors. Does the Minister agree with me that it is utterly outrageous that the UK Tory government is threatening this on the south of Scotland? 
Ivan McKay. Uh, yes, I do agree with the member on that, and clearly, as I highlighted my earlier answer, um, rural areas of the country will be particularly hard hit by, uh, by Brexit, and in particular by a no-deal Brexit. And it is um, completely unacceptable that the UK government is forcing on Scotland um, this uh, potential reset recession uh, for, for, for no reason other than to deal with the uh, infighting within the Conservative mm. Party. Question number seven, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the potential impact on the economy of a no-deal Brexit. Ivan McKee. The Scottish Government's Chief Economist published analysis on the 21st of February this year, setting out the immediate economic implications of a no-deal Brexit for the Scottish economy. The analysis indicated that there is a potential for the economy to contract by between 2.5% and 7% by the end of 2019, with the potential for the Scottish economy to be pushed into recession, depending on the way in which a no-deal Brexit evolves. Previous analysis published in Scotland's Place in Europe, People, Jobs and Investment, outlined the long-term implications of Brexit for Scotland's economy. Stuart Stevenson. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of concerns of fish processors in my uh, constituency uh, who are worried that they will be unable to obtain the necessary export health certificates in a timely fashion for getting their fresh fish products uh, to markets in Europe and elsewhere? Ivan McKee. The impact of a no-deal Brexit will have catastrophic consequences for the seafood sector in Scotland. Our seafood sector will be severely impacted by disruption at the port of Dover, which will jeopardise the just-in-time nature of the seafood supply chain. The sector will also be required to comply with a range of administrative burdens, in particular the requirement for export health certificates for all seafood consignments being exported to the EU. We anticipate at least a fourfold increase in the requirement for export health certificates with a potential additional cost to the industry of over £15 million per year. The Scottish Government continues to press DEFRA on our proposals for controlling imports and exports to the UK. Supplementary, Willie Rennie. Yeah, I agree with the Minister's remarks about uh, a no-deal Brexit. So has the Minister conducted any research to compare the negative economic impacts of a no-deal Brexit scenario with a no-deal independence scenario? Ivan McKee. Well, as Willie Rennie would be aware, if you read the Growth Commission report, the potential for an independent Scotland, um, standing alongside other nations across Europe, um, small to medium-sized nations, would lead to uh, significant increases in the growth rate within Scotland's economy. If you look across those nations, you look how they've grown over the last uh, decades compared to Scotland, the difference is not in the resources they have. We've got more resources in this country. It's not in the people that they have. We've got better trained and skilled individuals in this country. The only difference, the only difference is those countries are able to pursue their own economic policies because they are independent. Question number four was not lodged. Question number five, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with businesses regarding the potential economic impact of Brexit. Ivan McKee. The Scottish Government engages extensively with individual businesses and their representative bodies. Those discussions routinely confirm that while Scotland did not vote for Brexit, that is the biggest and most immediate economic challenge businesses face. Raising awareness in and action by businesses is vital. Last year, we launched Prepare for Brexit, offering readiness, self-assessment tools and expert advice, as well as access to learning and networking events and grants for Brexit planning support. That campaign can help many more businesses to take steps to enhance resilience despite the ongoing uncertainty of Brexit. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, businesses that I've spoken to in my constituency have been quite um, disappointed with the lack of engagement from the UK government. Can I ask the, Cab the Minister uh, if he can tell me if there's any evidence that the views of Scotland's business businesses have been heeded by the UK government or, as with most things relating to Brexit, they've been run roughshod over by the Tories in favour of keeping their party together? Ivan McKee. There is clear evidence of the UK government ignoring the views and interests of Scottish business. 
Let me focus on immigration policy, which is a very significant factor in ensuring businesses have the skilled workforce they and we need to grow and prosper. That's clear from two business quotes from the Spice report published in January, Immigration Policy, the Countdown to Brexit. This is the voice of business in Scotland. The FSB's Scotland Policy Chair, Andrew McRae, said the UK government's obstinate approach to immigration is a clear threat to many of Scotland's businesses and local communities. These proposals will make it nigh impossible for the vast majority of Scottish firms to access any non-UK labour and the skills they need to grow and sustain their operations. And Scottish Tourism Alliance Chief Executive Mark Cothrell said the UK government's measures on immigration could have potentially devastating effects on Scotland's tourism industry, in particular the £30,000 minimum salary threshold. There is no doubt that the government's plans will exacerbate the existing recruitment crisis considerably, placing our tourism industry and in what is one of the most important economic drivers for Scotland in severe jeopardy. The UK government is not listening on immigration or on a range of other issues relating to Brexit and the economy. A very quick supplementary and a very quick answer, please, uh, Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, it's estimated that unemployment will rise up to almost 8% with a no-deal Brexit. What are the plans has the Scottish Government to deal with this and also to mitigate uh, the impact of that? Ivan McKee. Uh, as a member will be aware, the, uh, the, Sc the Scottish Government Score Committee is meeting on a weekly basis to uh, evaluate and bring forward steps to, uh, to mitigate the worst impacts of Brexit and the extensive range of measures laid out in the Economic Action Plan, published earlier by my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, lays out um, a, a many, many steps that have been taken by the Scottish Government across the whole range of uh, uh, aspects of the economy to mitigate um, against the worst aspects of a no-deal Brexit. Question number six, Jamie Halcrow Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government how its budget will impact on Orkney and Shetland. Kate Forbes. Thanks very much, Presenting Officer. The budget invests in our local authorities, including Orkney and Shetland, to enable them to deliver services to the people uh, that live there, from education and social care to transport and planning. The budget delivers a fair financial settlement for local government by providing funding of £11.2 billion, which is a real terms increase of almost £300 million. And Orkney Islands Sh uh, Council and Island Shetland Islands Council will both receive their fair formula share of that total funding. Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Ahead of the conclusion of the budget process, Cabinet Secretary Mike Russell came to Orkney. While he was there, he spoke about the funding of internal ferries uh, in Orkney and Shetland and the shortfall be between what is given to the Council and cost of maintaining the services. Mike Russell said it was a big issue. He said it was an issue which obviously needs a resolution. Yet a month later, we hear there is no resolution. So why has this Scottish Government yet again failed to meet its own pledge to provide fair ferry funding for Orkney and for Shetland, a decision described by one local yeah, councillor as please Donald come to Trump conclusion. politics? And when will Mr Russell uh, pledge to go back and raise this big issue with Cabinet <coughs> colleagues? Did he do so? And if so, was he simply ignored? Kate Forbes. Well, I would ask Jamie Halker Johnson why he voted against £10.5 mm. million pounds for ferries yeah. in the budget uh, this year. Uh, and last year as well. And the Shetland and Orkney Island councils remain responsible for the delivery of the internal ferry services. But we recognise the challenges that that presents. And this year's budget has made available that £10.5 million this year, as well as last year, mm. for local authority ferry services. We've also ensured that with a local government settlement, yeah. the Orkney Islands and Shetland councils have their money to deliver services. And we've given more flexibility around uh, council tax. My question to Jamie Halker Johnson is how much more difficult would it be to fund local services in Orkney if we had to follow his tax plans and find an additional £500 million for those services? Exactly. Very quick supplementary, please, Liam MacArthur. Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to see the Minister have such a positive visit to Orkney earlier this week, but she will be informed that Orkney have received £200,000 less for internal ferry funding this year, leaving a shortfall of well over a million pounds. Now, how does that square with the government's commitment to the principle of fair funding for our lifeline internal ferry services? Kate Forbes. Thank you, and I did have a thoroughly enjoyable two days in Orkney and most jealous of Liam MacArthur's um, opportunities to go back there on a weekly basis. But we do recognise, as I said in my first um, answer, the, the challenges around 
around uh, local ferry services. I have that discussion myself with the local council. What we've been clear about in our uh, budget is to ensure that we do provide um, adequate funding and also have given local authorities who are actually responsible for the ferry service the funding that they need to deliver the services. Question number eight, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent meetings the Finance Secretary has had with ministerial colleagues regarding local government finance. Derek Mackay. As part of the annual budget process, I met with all relevant ministerial colleagues regarding local government finance, both individually and collectively. Local government finance was also discussed at meetings of the Cabinet in the lead-up to the announcement of the 2019-20 Scottish budget. Edward Mountain. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. When I last raised the issue of £5 million of funding required to remove overhanging rocks at Strom Ferry, the, Ministry of, the Minister of Energy, Connectivity and the Islands on the 15th of November, he confirmed he would raise this matter with the Cabinet Secretary. Therefore, can you confirm when you last met with the Minister what additional funds he requested for Stromferry and what funds you're going to make available? Derek Mackay. Well, I, as far as I understand uh, the issues of principal responsibility for Highland Council, uh, the member will be aware that we increase financial support to local government in both revenue and capital, uh, specifically uh, an uplift on capital that would be particularly uh, relevant here. I have actually done some research on what uh, Tory tax cuts would mean for individual local authorities and for <laughs> what pays for public services, the raising of revenue, what do the Tories want to do, cut tax for the richest in society to reduce the amount of revenue to Scotland's public services. The cut to Highland Council, if we followed Tory tax policy, would be £23.5 million just to that settlement, just to that council, when in fact this government is allocating more in resource and capital to Scotland's local authorities to get on with such infrastructure matters in the face of Tory opposition, which is reckless and irresponsible. We shall move on to the portfolio for environment and climate change. And something else I forgot to put in my script. What is it? <laughs> Land reform. Land reform. <laughs> Question number one, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government for an update on its plans to introduce a charge on disposable drinks cups. Mary Bouchon. As we indicated in the budget statement, the Scottish Government agrees in principle to introducing a, a charge for disposable drinks cups. But in deciding on how to proceed with that, we will consider the recommendations of the expert panel on environmental charging and other measures, which is due to report later this year. The panel is taking an evidence-based approach and considering a range of measures to address this issue. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for that reply and uh, I generally very much welcome the, the Scottish Government's action <coughs> on this matter. It's something I raised in, in the Chamber before and also uh, at the SNP conference. Does the Minister agree with me, however, that for this to be successful work, it needs to be done with retailers so that they can charge, so that they can change their way of working, such as signing up for some of the various club exchange schemes, help to improve any infrastructure challenges that may exist, particularly for independent retailers, and does the Minister provide, or can the Minister provide any information as to what the levy be invested into. Marie Gujo. I would absolutely agree with the member in that I do think we, we have to work with retailers. I think if we've got a chance of tackling this. And I don't know if the member will be aware of the, the Glasgow Cup movement, which was launched by the Cabinet Secretary uh, just recently. It was a Keep Scotland Be Beautiful have designed that movement. And it's a campaign really to make sure that single-use cups don't end up in landfill or end up as litter, that far more are recycled, and to really try and encourage people to move to reusable cups instead of disposable. Now, this has involved working with a range of partners such as Starbucks, Cafe Nero, Costa, Greggs, McDonald's, Bewley's, as well as the, the cup manufacturers themselves, because in, in Scotland, we use 500 million single-use uh, single cups a year. And in the greater 
greater Glasgow area, it's 95 uh, million. So this is a massive problem that we have to try and tackle. So we'll be interested, we'll be monitoring this project closely to see how this goes and to see if this is something that we could potentially roll out across the rest of Scotland. Supplementary, Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It has emerged that 1.5 million disposable cups were bought in the last three years through this SNP government's official catering contract, equivalent to one cup every minute. What assurance can the Minister provide that this situation will not continue? Mary Gushu. I thank the member for, for raising that question. I mean, that's an issue that I'd be more than happy to look at because I think as the Scottish Government, it's important for us to take a lead. And that's why in the, the government buildings, for example, uh, we removed the single-use plastics and have to use re reusable cups. But again, I will look into that issue and get back to the member with a response. Question two was not lodged. Question three, Annabelle Ewing. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the SEPA Health and Safety Executive Report regarding the Mosmorin petrochemical plant. Mary Cushion. The Scottish Government understands that the regulators have completed their investigations at the plant. SEPA published an update setting out the, the action taken to date in relation to the repeated unplanned flaring at the plant, uh, which is effective and appropriate. Nevertheless, SEPA hasn't ruled out future enforcement action if that's deemed necessary. Annabelle Yu. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer, and I am in fact aware that SEPA did publish their investigative uh, update last week. And one of the action points was a forward programme for environmental monitoring. Can the Minister provide any clarity as to what that environmental monitoring will in fact entail on the ground? Mary Gushu. SEPA recently announced enhanced air quality monitoring at the most modern complex, uh, which will include monitoring of the relevant pollutants in order to provide up-to-date monitoring data and comparison with the previous monitoring and modelling studies that have been undertaken. Now, that monitoring commenced in January of this year and it's expected to run until April, with the results being uh, published later this year. Now, the location of that monitoring equipment was determined following liaison with community representatives and the monitoring programme is in addition to the substantial work which has already been undertaken by Most Modern and Brayfoot Bay Independent Air Quality Monitoring Review Group, which advises Fife Council regarding the quality of the ambient air associated with air emissions at Most Modern. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to reduce the amount of plastic nurdles on beaches. Mary Gushu. Marine plastics are a global problem and we are taking actions to prevent and reduce nurdle pollution. We're working with the plastics industry to expand on their successful Operation Clean Sweep guidance. We are engaging with all sectors handling pre-production plastics and exploring the feasibility of a move towards a system which is auditable to uh, allow for traceability and accreditation. And on the 22nd of February at the Marine Litter Symposium, the Scottish Government committed to cooperative working with the other British Irish Council administration to further reduce the loss of pre-production plastics across the supply chain. Willie Rennie. I wish I was at the Marine Litter Symposium. Um, there are a particular concern on the beaches on the fourth estuary in my constituency, particularly Ruby Bay, where there are millions of these nurdles. I, I respect the Minister and the, and the answer, and I thank her for the answer that she's given, but what timescale is there for implementing these measures that the Minister has set out? How will it be monitored? And if they don't work, will the Minister consider legislation? Mary Gujo. Well, I think it's vitally important that we try and work with industry as far as we can on this, because this isn't just for the plastic industries themselves. The supply chains around this are very complex, and that's why I think we've got to work right across that to make sure we tackle this in the best way as possible. And I think I would rather look at and exhaust all of those options before we, before we consider taking any further action. I, am, I already mentioned Operation Clean, Clean Sweep, which is a plastics-led uh, uh, plastics industry-led initiative which is rapidly being adopted by industry members but we also have a pre-production plastic pellet steering group 
um, which has a membership which includes INEOS, Plastics Europe, British Plastics Federation, Hollier's Association, British Plastic and Rubber Association. So I think by with having this steering group and all the work that that would undertake, we can really start to try and make, have an impact on this problem. But I think I would also like to mention all the fantastic work that FIDRA have done and also the Marine Conservation Society with their great nurdle hunts and in really raising awareness of this vitally important issue. Short supplementaries, please, from Gail Ross and then John Scott. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister outline what else the Scottish Government is doing to tackle marine litter, given that approximately 20% of it originates from the marine sector itself? Mary Goodjohn. I'm really sorry, President Officer. I'll try and keep this short, but there is an awful lot of work that has been going on at the moment because littering at sea by the shipping industry is already prohibited under the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from uh, Ships. But there are a, a whole number of uh, initiatives that we are currently supporting. We've supported Chemo's Fishing for Litter Scheme since 2005, and in that time, 300 Scottish vessels have removed over 1,220 tonnes of waste from our seas. We have funded, uh, helped fund the Scrapbook Project, which is helping to map the marine litter sinks, which are right along our coastlines. We had the marine litter confidence. I detected a wee hint of sarcasm in Willie Rennie's voice, or I don't know if he was being serious about the confidence that we had, but that was vital to bring. It was an international confidence, which brought lots of people together so that we could hear ideas and what's happening in other countries elsewhere and to see where that collaborative work can take place. We've also, there's a £1 million innovation fund for plastics capture, collection and recovery. And the First Minister at that conference announced a £175,000 campaign to promote reusable sanitary products to reduce the 100 billion pieces of sanitary waste which are disposed of each year. John Scott. Officer, and this question may have been answered already. I'm not certain there was so much there, which was wonderful. But could the harvesting of nurdles on an industrial scale from our beaches, seas and oceans provide a resource for recycling generally, such as the building of roads as detailed in the press this week? And what is the Scottish Government doing to encourage the development of such a recycling industry in Scotland, in addition to what she may have already said? Mary Gisham. We're always looking, uh, looking to, happy to look at all these different uh, if there's innovative ways that we can work with those materials, always happy to look at that as well, but just to make sure that there isn't a knock-on impact and that we don't then see uh, more nurdles or more plastic pollution as a result, because all of these, of course, have to be carefully considered. But I think it's also vitally important to talk about some of the, the vital important work that's happening across our universities right now. Some of the Scottish, the work that's been done at our universities is at the forefront. I visited Stirling University, really, where they're recently, where they're undertaking two, uh, important pieces of work in relation to microplastics, mapping them across the ocean, and it's really, uh, they're really at the forefront of work in that area. And I think we're lucky to have uh, people working on that and being leaders in this field so that we can take strong positive action in Scotland. Question number five was not lodged. Question number six, Joanne Lamont. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Environment Secretary has had with the Transport Secretary regarding the environmental implications of the proposed personal rapid transport system for Glasgow Airport. Mary Gujo. The Cabinet Secretary has not held any meetings with Michael Matheson in his role as Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity regarding the environmental implications of the proposed personal rapid transport system for Glasgow Airport. The projects within the Glasgow City Region deal are for the relevant local partners to develop and deliver and the Glasgow Airport Access Project is being taken forward by Glasgow City and Renfrewshire Councils. Johan Lamont. Can I just say that I'm utterly astonished at that response. The Cabinet Secretary must be aware and the Minister must be aware that the Glasgow Airport rail link was seen to have social, economic and critically environmental benefits. Are you confirming that, um, given the decision to scrap this plan, that there was no environmental impact assessment of the people pod option as compared with the airport rail link option before that decision was made? And will she reflect on the fact that it's essential that the environmental issues round the airport route are properly addressed and that it's a failure of government for the environmental secretary not to be discussing this critical matter ahead of a decision which will have direct consequences across the west of Scotland. Mary 
Well, I certainly wouldn't be confirming that an environmental impact assessment had taken place. I mean, the initial asked question was about whether the Cabinet Secretary had met with the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, and that hadn't happened. So that's what I was talking about in my initial response to the member. And I would say that if there are any significant concerns, that, that those are issues that need to be raised with the relevant councils and with the City Region Deal Cabinet. Supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I ask the Minister what the impact on Ayrshire commuters and the Ayrshire economy would be should the airport uh, rail link, as proposed by Labour, be implemented? If there's any dire consequences from what we've been told it's going to be on the Ayrshire and Inverclyde economies. Marie Goujon. As I know the members around the Chamber will be aware, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity uh, was clear in the statement that he made to the Parliament um, on the, the 7th of January that there would be impacts on rail users should the tram train service between Glasgow Airport and Glasgow Central Station, as proposed by the City Region Deal project, be delivered. Now, the analysis has shown that while it might be possible to introduce a tram train service to Glasgow Airport, that would have a detrimental effect on performance and require the deduction of current rail services, the deferral of future service enhancements and uh, significant and high cost infrastructure enhancement at Glasgow Central, which are currently not funded. Question number seven, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Environment Secretary has had with the Energy Minister regarding the environmental impact of the proposed decommissioning of oil rigs at Hunterston. Marie Goujon. As a major infrastructure project, plans for Hunterston span several ministerial portfolios, including that of the Energy Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to environmental protection and working with the relevant consenting authorities to ensure that statutory environmental processes are undertaken in order to protect the environment whilst promoting Scottish opportunities within an emerging industry estimated to be worth £15 billion to 2025. Ross Greer. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, as a result of freedom of information requests by local residents, it was discovered that two Scottish Government agencies, Marine Scotland and Scottish National Her uh, Natural Heritage, both encouraged North Ayrshire Council to conduct a full environmental impact assessment, which they did not. I requested the Scottish Government call that in and require a full environmental impact assessment, and they declined to do so. Could the Minister please explain why, despite two government agencies recommending an EIA on what she herself has conceded is a major project involving half a million tonnes of dredging, the government declined to require an environmental impact assessment? Marie Goujon. Now, from what I understand, that I think since the time that the proposal was initially introduced, well, at that time in June 2017, Marine Scotland had determined at that time that an environmental impact assessment uh, wasn't needed. But I believe that since that time, the proposals that have come forward since then have substantially changed. So I believe that uh, officials are currently considering uh, whether revised plans that have come forward now require an environmental impact assessment. But I'd be happy to liaise with the member of the Cabinet Secretary, uh, contact the member if he wishes to discuss that further as this progresses. Short supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. So would the Minister not agree that in actual fact it was agreed cross-party that there should be no environmental impact assessment because all the information was that there would in fact be no damage to the SSAI at Hunterson. But what in fact this project will deliver is hundreds of jobs in an, for an area that it much requires it. And the Scottish Government through Scottish Enterprise have ordered a £10 million grant to Hunterson on condition that those jobs are delivered and in fact that there's no damage please. to the environment. And that damage, then if there is any damage to the environment, that money can in fact be clawed back in part or in whole. Marie Goujon. Yeah, I would say that the decisions taken at that time uh, about the not requiring an environmental impact assessment were based on the proposals at that time. Um, but uh, as I've just intimated to Ross Greer, the plans that have now come forward have sub are substantially different to those that were first submitted. So officials are considering whether or not an environmental impact assessment would then be required. Question number eight, Alison Harris. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what the timeline is for the ban on municipal waste going to landfill. Marie Goujon. The ban on biodegradable municipal waste going to landfill in Scotland will apply from the 1st of January 2021. Much progress has already been made and a significant number of local authorities and commercial operators have long-term or interim solutions already in place. However, we are aware of the significant challenges that some local authorities are facing and are working with public and private sector partners to address those. And our focus is on identifying ways in which they can comply with the ban as soon as possible. Alison Harris. 
I, I thank you for that answer. I actually appreciate that Falkirk Council are currently on target to meet this deadline because their current contract lasts until 2022, taking them over the 2021 deadline. So whilst this is in the short to medium term, could I ask, what are the longer term plans and solutions? Mary uh, As I said in my initial answer to the member, we're really trying to, well, we're working with COSLA, with Zero Waste Scotland, with SEPA, with the Scottish Environmental Services Association, and really trying to work with those councils who haven't identified any solutions. We have that target in place because I think I, when and, and that target was set in 2012 because I believe that we have to be ambitious and we need to set ambitious targets, especially when it comes to issues, uh, vitally important environmental issues such as this. So I think our priority right now, as I said, 14 councils. Uh, already have uh, a solution in place. Other councils have interim solutions, but the priority, priority for us right now is work, working with those local authorities to make sure that we can, if we can meet that time scale, we do, but we just really try and uh, implement that ban uh, as soon as possible. Short supplementary, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. With the upcoming ban on biodegradable municipal waste and landfill. It is important to have viable alternative solutions. However, does the Minister agree that that should not include private companies imposing unwanted and potentially dangerous incinerators in our communities? And could she possibly tell us when the environmental impact assessment into the proposed incinerator in Canberra Coat Bridge may be available? Short answer, please, Mary Gujong. I'm afraid for that specific element of the question, I don't have a response to that here, but I'd be happy to take that back to the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment so that she can get that information to the member.